Hey, what's up? It's Frank here from datadriven.tv. I just wanted to preface this episode we have with Trey Johnson, which is an excellent episode. Trey's a great guy and a great sport uh, that we did record this in September. However, the car accident and subsequent madness that is my uh, family having two children's birthdays in December uh, did kind of throw off the schedule. And for that, I do apologize to the audience you all, and uh, as well as to our guests. So, sorry, Trey, it took us so long to get this one out. Just craziness happens, and um, perhaps one day we will uh, we'll get someone who does the editing for us. One more thing is that my audio, for some reason, had all kinds of glitches this day. Uh, I was recording while I was on the road, and, um, well, you know, sometimes stuff happens. Fortunately, I was able to fix most of it in post-production. Um, so if you hear me uh, sounding a little too low, a little too loud, I apologize. I cleaned it up about as much as I could. And thank you for your patience. And without further ado, here's the show. Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts... Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hello and welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging fields of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. If you like to think of data as the new oil, then you can consider us car talk because we focus on where the rubber virtual road. And with me as ever in this epic road trip down the information superhighway is Andy Leonard. How are you doing, Andy? I'm doing well, Frank. How are you? I've had a very surreal morning. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Well, I woke up and um, I woke up real early today and then my phone was normal, right? So nothing there. And then about an hour later, uh, it's blinking like, and I can't see anything on the screen. Oh, no. Which I know sounds like a first world problem, but um, you don't realize how dependent you are on your device until it goes haywire. Oh, you don't have to tell me. I had a... <laughs> uh... I was scared to death yesterday. I I, I went to uh, Sequel Saturday Boston this weekend. I got really excited about some tech I saw. And I haven't done this in a really long time because, uh, well, I, I, I couldn't. And on the flight home, I pulled out my laptop. It was a couple hours flight from Boston to Raleigh. I opened it up. I actually connected to the Internet. And I started playing around with some tech. Now, the reason I couldn't do that for a really long time is I had this big belly in the way. So, uh, thanks to uh, Keto and Bulletproof, I have less belly, and I was able to do some work. Well, it turns out that when you do that, it puts uh, Windows 10 will put itself into something called airplane power saving mode or power mode. Interesting. Yeah, and automatically. Well, as far as I could tell, I didn't do it. I didn't even know it existed. Huh. And I get back to my office, you know, yesterday morning and plug my laptop into the docking station and start working. And about an hour later, I get a message saying, hey, your battery's low. And I'm like, what is going on? So it was panic there for an hour or so until just on a whim, I happened to look at it. What It was weird because it would charge if it was turned off. <laughs> so, um, now that makes perfect sense, right? Because right. lithium batteries generate more heat while they're being charged mm -hmm. and being used at the same time. And, you know, once I figured it out, I was like, oh, yeah, that, I, mean, I get that. And I couldn't find anything about that online. I just happened to look at it, see that mode and change it back to my previous setting. And but, yeah, at that time, uh, yesterday morning for about an hour, I was freaking out. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I need my laptop. <laughs> I tell you, it's funny. The um, I have a I have a separate hotspot and a an iPad with a um, built integrated 4G. And yeah. every once in a while, my wife is like, you know, maybe we should you know pare down the number of lines we have. But today right. made uh, made it from being a disaster <laughs> to like because I have to travel to some meetings today. Made three right. from a disaster into a uh, just a big nuisance. Wow. Yeah. So. Well, um, I'm friends with Trey Johnson, who's our guest today. Yeah, and Trey is the chief, chief evangelist. Okay. Sorry, Andy. That's okay. I did a, 
That was a bad segment. That was a bad segment. Maybe we'll keep it in. I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Trey and I, um, we've, we uh, connect every now and then at uh, speaker events, single Saturday events. He is the uh, chief evangelist at Zap. Uh, he's an author, speaker, consultant, tech leader. And he's out of Jacksonville, Florida, the Jacksonville area. And I was down there for a while. I think that may have been where we met, Trey. I'm not positive of that when I lived down there back in the early 2000s. But I'd like to welcome you to the show. Awesome. Well, no, no, thank you, Andy. And, you know, yeah, we've been, gosh, we've been running in the same circles for a, for a good while. So <laughs> I guess that's the great thing about the, you know, the sequel family as a whole is, you know, you kind of, at some point kind of forget where you, you met each other and just assume you've been doing <laughs> the same thing forever. So, but uh, cool. yeah, glad so, to be here. Awesome. Great to have you on the show. And um, go ahead, Andy. Sorry. No, no, my mojo is all off today because of my phone. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, Trey, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, about what you do for Zap? Sure. Yeah, no, happy to do so. So, yeah, as you said, I'm in a chief evangelist role with Zap. I've been with the business uh, in a leadership capacity for about 10 years and um, initially started to, to get, you know, kind of the North American business off the ground and if worn just about every hat up and down the hat rack. And uh, I've been very fortunate that, uh, you know, the business had a lot of faith in me kind of being the the face and the voice of the organization, you know, in the, particularly in technical circles. And so that's really what I do today is, is uh, for the last six months or so, I've been our chief evangelist and uh, set aside a lot of the other organizational responsibilities that I had so that I can focus a lot on, you know, kind of the, the data journey that a lot of folks are taking and, you know, talking through, you know, what we're seeing in the market and, you know, how Zap tends to intersect, you know, with those people's journey. Interesting. So what exactly does Zap do? Yeah, so good question. So Zap, uh, Zap as an organization um, has, a, has a product called Zap Data Hub. And what Zap Data Hub does is uh, basically connects to um, one or more uh, disparate data sources and really kind of fully automates the creation of the data warehouse um, and the multi-dimensional mole app or analysis services destination environments. And we really got our fo start and focus from the ERP space. We started working with Microsoft Dynamics platforms particularly. So all the things that used to be called Dynamics AX and NAV and, and other products like CRM that are all now in the Dynamics you know, 365 umbrella. Um, we got our start there um, really because those those customers in that market, you know, had a really difficult time getting information out of those applications. Um, the technology got to the point where it was mature enough that we could actually look beyond uh, the dynamic space. And we are now OEM'd into some of the Sage uh, global ERP products as well. And so we've got a lot of got a lot of knowledge about connecting to those ERP specific platforms. We have some smarter data sources. So, you know, traditional data sources go and interrogate schema, you know, all that good stuff, maybe do a little bit of data profiling. We do those things, but what we also do with our smarter data sources is we're capturing application metadata. So that could be the way things are uniquely labeled in the application, you know, so on and so forth. And that can make its way all the way through to the reporting layer, you know, which we really advocate that folks use tools like Power BI or Tableau. Um, to go up against the data that we uh, that we produce in our data stores. Very interesting stuff. So, just a, a lot of support and a lot of tooling and utility for uh, your customers. It sounds like to me. Yeah, you know, very much so. I mean, you know, and and, to, and I know your audience probably for this uh, for this podcast is probably a little bit more of a technical audience, but there is the vast majority of people that have information needs, particularly in the mid market are not necessarily well staffed, right? You know, from an IT perspective. And so a tool set that really kind of fully automates that journey and allows them to focus a lot more on the analytics and a lot less on kind of the, the movement of data and those sorts of things is, you know, certainly a winner in most of their books. So. Well, and I've also seen organizations that they, they kind of think they want to get into the data space, but they're also under the data science and ML space, but they're also understaffed. So I don't think, you know, 
I, I think it's an interesting it's an interesting time we live in because I think we are kind of on that cusp of um, data becoming not just important to business but crucial. I think it already is there, but I don't think everybody's. Well, yeah, and I, I think the I think the workloads that that are people are being asked to do that are of the most value typically involve after the data is acquired, right? You know, so it's still analytics design, or it's still potentially all the great things that you do with data science from you know machine learning model training and you know those sorts of things. But you know the the, the, the old school business of acquiring data, you know, call it ETL or whatever you want to call it, is it's just not as high on the value end of things. You know, people just kind of expect to be able to get data and uh, then they want to really, you know, focus their time, effort and energy into doing things with that data that are valuable to the right. business. Yeah, completely makes sense. So what do you think is holding people back, Trey, from uh, from doing more with their data these days? Well, you know, I, I think that there's still, you know, there's still, you know, some of the mentality that folks are probably still more invested in, in trying to acquire the data, you know, for sure. Um, you know, I, I had a, you know, the good fortune of being at the uh, Azure Data Fest in Atlanta not too long ago and did a couple of sessions and even subsequently did a blog about it, where I was talking about, you know, moving the BI workloads to the cloud and, you know, it's amazing to me that there's such a high level of interest in Azure, but there's not necessarily a representative audience that right. has already done it, right? You know, there's 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 folks that, you know, they want to do it. They're really, you know, they, they think that it's something they really instinctively want to do. But even even this past weekend at SQL Saturday in Atlanta, you know, had a similar session and folks were thinking about it, but you know, that's, that's kind of where they're at, you know, as they're starting to, to think about it and they're, they still have a lot of other, you know, workloads. So what's kind of keeping them from yeah. doing more with their data? You know, I think part of it is they're, they're trying to rationalize, are they going to keep doing the same things from a pattern perspective of what we call traditional relational data structures, or, you know, I think in some ways they're trying to figure out, Hey, can we, can we do stuff with this non-relational data, the stuff that's, really best expressed on an Azure data platform, streaming of data, you know, those right. sorts of things. I think there's just a lot of people that are, they're trying, they want somebody else to say, yeah, it's, it's good. We've done it. It's, it's, you know, it's really, you know, exciting to take that journey. And, you know, they're, I think they're just waiting for some people to take that first step, you know, based on the community folks. So how sure. far do you think we are from people, you know, being willing to take that first step? And, and what do you think, um, people like you who are influencers in the community can kind of push that along. Oh, I, you know, I, I think people are, I think people are getting closer. I think, you know, there is this, you know, the audience that, you know, we interact with at a SQL Saturday or an Azure Data Fest or even a past summit, you know, these are the people that are, you know, typically the technical influencers, you know, so they're the ones that are, influencing technically what the business does, but, you know, they still probably on some level have to seek approval of, you know, management and those sorts of things, you know, for some of these projects. And so I think the enthusiasm that you see at these community events probably turns into, you know, thoughts being expressed about patterns they want to explore to their management. And, you know, I, I think we're not far off from people who saying, okay, hey, here's a project, you know, go, go do this, even if it's a proof of concept or skunk works or whatever you want to call it, you know, I think people are going to really start doing that more and more. With that said, you know, the, the, the upper end of the spectrum from a business perspective, the enterprises, I think they're pretty invested in, in, in doing these sorts of things, but, you know, they're just not, you know, not necessarily looking to promote outwardly that they're doing, you know, machine learning type right. things and other stuff, especially if it ties back to corporate strategy. Right. So. Um, I think what's interesting is there's already a lot of uh, machine learning being done in retailing, and, and you don't hear a lot of it unless there's a controversy. Yeah, no, that, that's very true. That's very true. You know, I saw the coolest thing at, at the Azure Data Fest, and I think uh, Patrick LeBlanc did it again, the, the SQL Saturday in Atlanta, where he was using, uh, I think it was a, a camera, um, and Patrick works for Microsoft, but, but Patrick was using a, a camera attached to a Raspberry Pi device to basically read 
audience reaction and using um, a lot of kind of the, the Azure, you know, cognitive framework to detect, you know, where people, what was their sentiment? And, you know, you think about that as, you know, okay, that's a really cool thing to show. But if you think about the practical applications of it in a retail space, you know, maybe mounted near a display so you can actually judge people's reactions to displays and, you know, other things like that, that just becomes a totally different data acquisition pattern than probably most people have even thought about previously. And that's, that's what's really cool is I, I'm looking forward to people building enough baseline knowledge through great examples like what Patrick showed so that they can then in turn go back into their business setting and, and you know, really maybe start to un, unblock, you know, some of the ideas that uh, they just haven't been able to express to others. Very cool. So one of the questions we like to ask all our guests, and we kind of work these questions in, Trey, whenever we talk to folks, is mm -hmm. um, how did you find your way into data? And we're really looking for, did data find you or did you find data? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I think I think uh, probably in a lot of ways, you know, data found me. And so I've, I've had the I've had the good fortune of being well, really for the last 25 years, I've worked mm. with SQL Server, you know, so I was still still in the, at the collegiate level uh, in an internship capacity and had gone to an organization um, that uh, as an intern, you know, they were actually bringing me on board full time before mm. I even graduated. And, you know, they were a, a SQL Server uh, organization. Um, they brought me in as their person to investigate all of their decision supporting technologies and to kind of drive some decisions. And, you know, I, I literally got started with SQL Server and BI practically at the same time, and I haven't left either one. So it's it's been kind of wild in that regard. But in that case, data and a paycheck <laughs> kind of found me at the same time, <laughs> you know, which, which is great. You know, and I've, 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 if it wasn't, if it wasn't fun, and if it wasn't, you know, something that was a passion of mine, obviously, I probably wouldn't have stuck mm -hmm. with it, you know, for as long as I have. But, uh, but yeah, it, and the evolution of, of SQL Server and the evolution of, you know, data has just been really something to watch. You know, you, you certainly feel like an old guy when you start quoting the, you know, the decades that you've been around a particular technology. But, you know, it's just the reality that uh, there have been some really cool things that have happened, I think, more so in the last, you know, 10 years. So, a little more than 10 years ago, I was on the past board. And, you know, after leaving that and really focusing all my energy on Zap, um, it's just been amazing, all of the transformational things that have been happening in the SQL releases and the, the maturation of the cloud and just everything. Right. It's just amazing. Interesting. So so with that in mind, what is the, what's your favorite part of your current gig? You know, I can honestly say, you know, I, I, I wore I wore such an you know an executive kind of behind the scenes hat, you know, or business only kind of hat for a number of years at Zap, um, that it's really nice to kind of put that hat a little bit back up on the rack and take off the, you know, the propeller hat, if you will, and 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 really be able to dig more into the technology, talk more about the technology, interact with folks that are, you know. In the, in the most current way of thinking, you know, around data and those sorts of things and just help translate what it is that Zap does that, that might be a benefit to those folks. And that's, that for me is, is really the best part is I, you know, I spend, you know, a good portion of my day, you know, evangelizing through social media, writing blogs, you know, doing a lot of those types of activities. And then the, the balance of my day, you know, you know spending my time with the Azure VMs and you know, all sorts of other stuff, you know, just really, really, you know, kind of, you know, unfortunately we're recording this, but, you know, we'll just say playing with the technology for the benefit of being able to express to others, you know, kind of what the benefit yeah, is. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you've got, had an opportunity to uh, catch any of the announcements coming out of Ignite, which is going on this week. We're recording this on the 25th of September, 2018. Um, have you had an opportunity to catch any of the new announcements? So a little bit of it, you know, the, the, the SQL 2019 stuff is just incredible. I mean, you know, the, the, you know, they're putting, 
but the combination of SQL servers, relational engine, and HDFS is uh, probably oh gosh, I'm kind of spacing for a moment. One other item, kind of just in Spark. That's right, in Spark. Um, you know, all three of those, you know, kind of in the single platform. That's going to be very cool because you know, no longer is it disparate in any way, um, which is great. Yeah, totally agree. I um, I actually wrote a blog post about it uh, yesterday, and yeah, years ago. I was talking with uh, Scott Curry, the person who invented Bemmel, and was Ooh. asking him, you know, Scott and I have known each other for years now, and I was just kind of picking his brain some. I was like, what do you think I should I should learn next? What do you think I should do? And he said, spark. <laughs> so I took that Ooh. advice. I, I, you know, I, don't, I won't say that I got into it as hard and heavy as I should have uh, at the time, but since then... Um, and part of the reason has really been Frank. Frank writes an article for MSDN Magazine, uh, a column called Artificially Intelligent. And, you, you mm -hmm. know, everyone listening should go read read that column. Frank's awesome. And I get to do a lot of the tech editing. And it was really cool. When I started seeing some of the examples that Frank was creating, um, you know, I saw stuff that just hadn't clicked before. Um, and it was really neat. So it's Frank, you're, uh, you're responsible for kind of upping my spark game there. And not long after, well, we got into edX too. Frank started taking the data science curriculum at edX and, and Frank's got the, uh, the data science certificate and the big data certificate and almost the AI certificate. Almost. But very cool. Yeah, there's a lot Very of neat cool. stuff out there that you can do with it. It's and Trey, you you've been around, um, you know, Microsoft long enough. Frank, you have too. Where this is a whole different Microsoft when it comes to things like Spark. That's open source. Well, I think that's the other thing too is that you know for a long mm. period of time, I think there was a kind of concern uh, among SQL professionals. Uh, one would even say fear and loathing, perhaps, of these open source big data tools. Um, and ah. I think that there's, uh, um, but I think, I think that there's, there's the realization is that relational database engines are not going away. Uh, it's going to be an and rather than an or right. operator. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I did, yeah absolutely. And, and, you know, and, and, and that's, that's the really interesting thing is that, you know, if you if you look at the way that technology kind of amassed before really enterprise grade projects like mm -hmm. hit the web, right? You know, there was there was just there was a whole range of technologies that were out there, whether it be you know Java or you know even preceding the .NET framework. You know, there was a lot for people to know. There was a lot for them to learn. And, and oh, by the way, they need to learn how to write data to and from databases and all that good stuff. I think what has happened is that there's there's still plenty to learn there, and, I, and I'm, I've kind of left that segment far behind in, in my technical journey. But now, you know, I'm starting to see a little bit of a parallel in kind of the current market that we're in, where if a person's wearing a DBA hat, for example, well, you know, they, they really probably need to, you know, kind of invest in, you know, being a bit more of a learner. Um, as they go forward here, because there's there's so much to learn. There's so many new things that are coming, and they're complementary to what the people already know. And so, if people can look at it as they're building on top of what their current skills are, versus having to potentially retool and replace their skills, they're going to be incredibly valuable, uh, you know, as they go forward. Um, you know, and and that's true of everything. But you know, in one one very simple example, and it it's going to sound a little bit silly, but you know, the folks that are invested around analysis services, you know, that have spent any time with it over the last, well, it's been around since 99, but any time in the last, you know, 10 years or so that really understand kind of the multidimensional side of it, understand things like MDX, well, that, you know, Microsoft does not necessarily come out and said, hey, the multidimensional cube is going away or right. any of those sorts of things. But frankly, you can't go learn MDX from anybody anymore. And, you know, those are the sort of things. So if you're sitting there, you learn that. If you're a real analysis services person, you need to invest in DAX and, you know, some of the other things as well. And then you you just kind of continue that right part of your journey. So. Right. Yeah, it's it's definitely, it's, it's interesting. And the shift is occurring. And, you know, there's, 
it, it's, I agree with what Frank said earlier, though. I still see a both and, although, you know, there are enterprises out there who've done, uh, who, who have significant investments in things like, you know, uh, analysis services, cubes and stuff like that. What do you think their choice is moving forward, Trey? Well, I think I think Microsoft is not ever going to you know turn off uh, a technology that is being you know widely used, and you know the the multi-dimensional cubes, the MOLAP cubes, instead of the tabular models, you know, which is more kind of the current technology, those MOLAP cubes are still going to stay in use. I mean, there's still very specific scenarios where you know applications are are working well with them, and Microsoft incrementally you know invests in that. There's not a lot of people I think within Microsoft that that know or could touch the code base around the multi-dimensional side of the engine. But, you know, there, you know, if you, if you ask some of the people that are kind of high up the food chain at Microsoft around multi-dimensional, I think there's still a hesitance to say, Hey, we're not ever going to touch right. that again. Right. You know, because, it, because it, you know, it has its place and, you know, who knows, you know, we may see some hybrid of tabular and multi-dimensional, that kind of reasserts itself in the next, you know, God, next totally agree. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's entirely yep. possible. So. All right. So we have a set of complete the sentence questions. Our first one is okay. when I'm not working, I enjoy blank. When I'm not working, um, I enjoy taking apart oh. Porsches and hopefully put them back together <laughs> again. correctly. <laughs> <laughs> really? That sounds interesting, hobby. Yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit bit in that regard. Uh, my 15 year old and I are actually in the process of reassembling a 1987 Porsche 924 S for him. It's gone through, gone through a lot of you know hand done restoration. It's wonderful to kind of be able to give you know a son or a daughter you know some life skills you know that uh, you know they they can see that they can actually take things apart and put them right. back together again and, you know, understand the mechanics. And frankly, a car from that era is just so much easier to understand <laughs> than, you know, a more modern computerized vehicle. So. This is true. Plus you'll be the coolest kid in school for sure. Well, that's the hope. <laughs> that's the hope. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, our next complete the sentence is I think the coolest thing in technology today is, Blank. Now I know we kind of touched on some of this, but specifically, what is the coolest thing in technology? Oh, you know, I'm 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 becoming just increasingly enamored with the consumer space around technology. You know, I you know I, I think and and maybe part of it is you know guys like us, we spend so much of our time around technology that's used in the business context. I mean, I it's going to sound relatively silly, but just the interactivity with you know devices like Alexa or you know Cortana and you know those sorts of things and the the skills that you know uh, land on those devices and what people can do and the questions they can ask and the information they can access you know i've got elderly parents you know it, it's 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 just an amazing thing that you know we've taken what was uh you know something that was you know you you, you know a long time ago you had to figure out how to you know dial up you know an, an isp and then launch a web browser and then ask the right question to get potentially the right answer and that we went through all these wonderful enhancements around Google as a search engine and Bing and others and you know now we've landed on devices that you know you, you basically just ask the question out loud and you know a lot of the times you get you get actually pretty darn good answers so I'm really I, th I think that's the the most interesting thing or the coolest thing in technology today is that we've really I think done a good job or those that have built these things have done a good job of bringing it into the context of the home. That makes a lot of sense. I find myself, I was, uh, I was on a business trip recently and, um, I'm in the hotel and I'm like, Alexa, what time is it? And it's like realizing that, um, that it's not with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, Frank. <laughs> All right, one last complete this sentence, Trey. I look forward to the day when I can use technology to blank. Um, I really, I think I look forward to the day when I can use technology to to answer email a hundred percent without me having to intervene. <laughs> that would be that'd be awesome. Um, certainly, I love communicating with folks, but you know, you, I, I've 
And I don't know about, you know, what other people's inboxes look like, but I would say, you know, on any given day, about half the stuff in my inbox, I really don't want it there. And I'm not sure why it ended up there. And I, I really am a little bit passionate about making sure it doesn't come <laughs> back. So um, if, <laughs> if there's some technology that would, you know, dramatically help with, you know, that level of interaction with, you know, thanks, but no thanks, uh, that would be awesome. A tray bot, if you will. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's a whole market right there. I can see it. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think so. We, have a we can make a tray bot. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so here's a, another question. Uh, share something uh, different about yourself, but uh, we have a nice clean rating on um, on iTunes. And that definitely helps us rank with ranking. But so it is a family podcast. Yeah, sure. Important. Sure. Yeah. You know, well, I, you know, I mean, I kind of, I kind of probably, you know, shared a little bit of about it with the whole Porsche thing. You know, I, I think, uh, I think, you know, probably the, the thing that's not, you know, always appreciable when we're, you know, interacting with people that are talking about technology and those things are the, the other things that from a hobby standpoint really drive them. But I, but, you know, I'm doing the thing with my son, but I actually have a, a few more of those cars and, you know, it's, it's really uh, certainly a passion of mine. I've got uh, a couple other uh, Porsche 928s and I like to drive, uh, nice. drive them on road trips because uh, the design of that vehicle was more of a, uh, an over the road kind of car instead of an off the line kind of car. And, uh, to be honest, it's, it's still one of the most comfortable over the road cars that, uh, that I, I've had the fortune of driving. So, you know, it's, it's really exciting to, uh, to do those things. And I, I'll go to events as, you know, far away as a few thousand miles away. Um, you know, just make a incredibly long weekend of it. And, you know, it's, uh, it's good times. Nice. Nice. I recently sold my 76 Eldorado convertible. Okay, cool. Um, that was, that was a painful sell, but, um, it's definitely repairing that. It was way outside of my, my wheelhouse. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, I grew up in a household, my, my father, you know, I love him to death. He's not at all mechanically inclined. And, um, you know, so I, I, I ended up being kind of the, the go-to kid that liked to figure out how to change the oil and all the other stuff. And, uh, you know, that, uh, <laughs> translated to where I'm at today, you know, data is oil changing. So. <laughs> Well, data is the new oil. Oh, there you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. So my, my dad's actually a mechanic, and uh, and, and that's also why I'm, I'm in a, the technology field, because I remember watching him work on vehicles, and um, a mechanic is sworn to never work on anything they own while the sun is up. I'm just saying. Um and we didn't have a garage or anything. So I was the kid. I'm the oldest. I got to hold the light. And I was like, I am not doing this when I get older. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> for, for me, it's, it's very much a mentally disassociative thing, you know, because, you know, you sit in front of screens and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, it's, it's all great. But, you know, to, to be able to actually go, go use hands and, you know, use the brain in a little bit different oh, capacity. It's, it's very therapeutic. I, I totally get that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so Trey, um, Audible is a sponsor of uh, the Data Driven Podcast. And I'm just curious if you listen to audio books or if not, if you've read any good books lately you'd like to recommend. Well, you know, I'm, it's, no, it's a great, it's a really great question. I, I, I haven't really had the, occasion to get into audiobooks too terribly okay. much and you know and I tend to when I'm when I'm reading I'm, I'm generally trying to go after stuff that, that kind of aligns for the most part either with my recreational passion or in this case you know the the things that are kind of I'm invested in around data and whatnot um, I've read several of Stephen Few's books um, Stephen Few is a wonderful author about you know kind of information design and visualization and those sorts of things and I've actually got a paperback book that's <laughs> that's sitting not too far away from me right now uh, by Stephen. I'm going to read it uh, over this weekend when my wife and I are down in Miami. And um, it's called Big Data, Big Dupe, a little book about a big bunch of nonsense. Oh, wow. And uh, I'm, I'm really <laughs> I'm really interested. And in, in the reason why is it's you know one of the one of the taglines that says. If data, if big data, or sorry, if data is the new oil, 
the big data is the new snake oil. <laughs> and so, so, so I, you know, you, you know, with a, with a tagline like that, you got to at least, you know, read it. I, I, it doesn't look like it's that big of a book. It's, it's Absolutely. Maybe 100 pages or something like that. So, yeah. So I, yeah. you know, for years, people have asked me about big data and, you know, I kind of, whenever I've talked about it, I've said, I, you know, I talk about big data all the time, just big is silent. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> well, the big is assumed now. I mean, like, you know, I, I, I often pull off this example that in 2016, I interviewed at a company, not going to name them because um, naming them would be shaming them. Um, they were just so impressed that they had a four terabyte database. Like that was like, mm-hmm. and I kind of dug into that and it was basically, you know, when the guy who's currently CIO started he started kind of at the bottom wrong and this database was his baby mm-hmm. and uh like and i did you know didn't really have the heart to tell him that you know four terabytes aren't a lot of data anymore right you know yeah yeah no no you know it, it, but you know and what's really what's really amazing to me is a lot of these erps that you know we have a lot of the zap data hub solution uses as a principal data source we're not talking about extraordinarily large right. volumes of data you know, but this, it's just incredibly important, you know, when you're talking about you're building your financials and it tracks your sales processes and it shows you from a supply chain standpoint, you know, kind of what you're doing. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of the lifeblood of the company, but, you know, there's there's organizations that they might be between 100 or 200 gigabytes of data. I mean, which is just doesn't sound like anything yeah. these days, but for them, it's everything. So. Well, I think there's a there's an evolving myth out there that you have to have something like, you know, petabytes of data before you can start using these tools and that's not true. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, a spreadsheet absolutely. with 50 rows in it could be just enough to, to glean some insight from something, you know? Oh yeah. 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 Well, and, you know, this, a long time ago, it feels like, feels like really practically a lifetime ago, I was working with a company and we were doing a lot of handcrafted stuff around machine learning. We had a, a gentleman who was kind of our chief scientist before they call people chief scientist, um, that he was, uh, uh, he had graduated from MIT with oh, wow. a math degree, and he was writing neural he was writing neural networks and visual LASIK. Ouch. Wow. And yeah, yeah, and he was you know, but it was it was just incredible. I mean, we were we weren't talking about massive data sets, but the ability to predict, you know, the cost of healthcare populations and the ability to, you know, look at what should be offered from a preventative nature into some of these other healthcare. Uh, scenarios it was just amazing and you know we were we were actually very good at what we did and it was uh it was actually a fairly profitable yeah. <laughs> uh, business uh, you know it, it, it's it's amazing though you know but you're right you know data the, the the data ceiling has gone so high at this point you know that the, the people probably don't even understand you know how high that actually is right so if you uh did decide to get into audible audio uh, Audiobooks. Uh, you can go to thedatadrivenbook.com, a handy domain name that uh, I give credit 100% to Andy. <laughs> and um, you'll be redirected to Audible, and you'll get one free book. And oh, cool! Yeah, yeah, and it is very addictive. So if you do get a subscription, uh, you know we'll get a we'll get a commission for that, and that helps support the show. I personally have just finished uh, the Power of Habit, which um, surprisingly had a chapter on the the Target controversy. Uh, where Target was able to figure out who's pregnant before um, anyone else does. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting book. And I know Andy's working through or just finished Bulletproof, or was it Headstrong? Well, tr- one thing, Trey, um, is where can people learn more about you? Oh, sure. You know, I... I I, you know, highly encourage people if they want to and follow me on Twitter at, at Trey Johnson, um, or they can certainly um, read a little bit more, you know, about the, the, some of the things that I've been talking about, particularly as it relates to Zap at zapbi.com slash blog. Um, a lot of uh, the posts are out there. Um, and, you know, look for me to SQL Saturday or, you know, a local community event, because I, I have no doubt I'll be continuing to do that even more so now. Very cool. Awesome. Thanks for joining us and um, see you next time. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. 
Don't just listen, become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. Sign up today at datadriven.tv.